Hi guys, my name is Emily. Welcome back to the Hashtag DT Project 17, a reading project in which I read the Dark Tower series for the first time ever and record my thoughts on it. Two disclaimers. One, I have not read the whole series, so if I'm saying something that doesn't make sense based on your understanding of having completed the series, that is why. I haven't finished the series yet. Disclaimer number two, I do not care about authorial intentions. I'm interested in reading the series in terms of my educational background, which is in English, and my own research interests, which is in fantasy literature. I'm not going to do a review for Song of Susanna, this is just my spoiler-filled thoughts on Song of Susanna. So this is the sixth novel in the Dark Tower series. It was published on June 28th, 2004, which is just seven months after Wolves of Kala, and the book that follows this comes out on September 21st, 2004. There's only three months between this book and the conclusion, so it's interesting that in terms of publishing, time is speeding up. Like, things are rushing to a conclusion, and if we think about that in terms of my last episode's discussion of time as a gyre spiraling towards this large point of chaos, I think that's kind of interesting that the narrative itself is spiraling out towards a point of chaos, sort of faster and faster out of control, and the actual publication of the physical objects has sped up just an observation. So I've actually decided to film two videos, so there will be an entirely separate video focusing on stanza 11, the writer, because I have a lot of thoughts on that, and uh, I, I need to isolate those thoughts. So today I'm going to be focusing on everything else in the book, and everything else here is mostly going to be Susanna. Let's start with the fact that Susanna wants to call her baby Mordred. Who the heck is Mordred? Mordred, of course, is a character from Arthurian legend. We already know that this series is drawing heavily on other fantasy texts, including Arthurian legend. Mordred is notoriously the traitor who fought King Arthur and who mortally wounded him, which doesn't bode well for Roland, who is sort of our Arthur figure. He is the last in the line of those descended from King Arthur. Arthur Eld, right? In Arthurian legend, Mordred is usually related to King Arthur in some way. So in some texts, he's Arthur's son. In some texts, he's Arthur's nephew. It just depends on where and when this story is coming from. So that Roland would be Mia's chap's biological father is sort of in line with these narratives. So via a third party, Roland has inseminated Susanna, which is sort of interesting when we think about all of the layers that go into that. One, they are a found family that Katet bonds them together in a familial way, so it's an incestuous relationship. Mordred, or Mia's chap, is the product of incest in a way. Uh, it also mirrors the relationship between Roland and his love Susan Delgado, um, who died while pregnant with Roland's son. So if these characters are parallel, if Susanna is Susan, that doesn't super bode well for Susanna, and I'm worried for Susanna because she is one of my favorite characters in this series, possibly one of my favorite Stephen King characters ever. I'm a little bit worried that these parallel narratives will have similar endings. I think Eddie and Roland are also pretty worried about what giving birth to this uh, demon creature will do to Susanna, because I think it's also sort of textually evident that even though the thing growing inside Susanna is biologically theirs, it is a being that will belong to the Crimson King because Mia has struck this bargain with him in order to become pregnant. It's also a little bit gross that Mia's whole purpose in life is to become a mother. By sharing the same body, Susanna has become a mother, and that is one of those fantasy tropes that we see that often destroys a character. We have this badass independent female character who throughout her narrative does super epic, awesome, subversive things, and then she becomes a wife and mother, and that is the conclusion of her subversion. While I don't see Susanna Odetta Detta being the type of character to give up and to sort of perform normative femininity, in that way, like giving up everything, the way, like the way Eowyn does, where she's like, I won't touch a sword anymore, I'm going to devote my life to being wifely and motherly. I don't see Susanna and all of her facets being that type of character. I do see Mia as 
part of the sort of stacked personalities in this one body wanting to be a mother and Susanna having no control over that and having her narrative sort of cut off and I do also see the potential for uh, death and that also cutting off her narrative and just the history of women in fantasy having their narratives cut off by having a child. Like very rarely do we see a woman who becomes a mother and continues to be subversive. That is something that sort of hurts my heart and makes me worried. But as we've been sort of reminded throughout this series, we are not owed a happy ending. We are owed the sort of same repeating narrative conclusion. If all literature is told across sort of shared narratives, if all narratives are part of the same sort of history, making the same plots, oftentimes these things don't end well. They come to a really awful repetition in the gyre and uh, that that's not a good thing for anyone. I think these sort of shared narratives, these common narratives that make up the fantasy genre and literature as a whole is something that we are cognizant of throughout. There's actually this line, quote, we've been haunted by books, end quote. And that idea that we've been haunted by books, I think that's true for this series. We have The Wizard of Oz, we have Charlie the Choo Choo, but we also have all of the text that sort of ground this narrative, right? We have the poetry, the fairy tales, all of these elements haunt the narrative and shape the narrative and inform the narrative that we're reading um, and really demonstrate the constructedness of this narrative, which I think becomes particularly relevant when we get to stanza 11 and we meet the character Stephen King. And I'm gonna stop here for today because I want to talk about stanza 11 and the character Stephen King in a video all by itself. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below on the way you see this series playing with various literatures. What else has this series drawn upon and borrowed from that maybe I've missed? What references have you picked up on? What sort of similar plots and characters have you picked up on? I would love to collect all of the references and sort of see the body of literature that informs this work from all of our different perspectives because we all come to this text with different baggage. We all come to this text having read different works. So let's chat about intertextuality. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you soon to talk about Stands 11. Bye.